Well, as we start another week in lockdown with no end in sight, let's turn back to food and look at the food we eat and let's look at how we get energy from the food that we consume. But if you're waiting for this big list of what you should eat and the big list of what you shouldn't eat, that's not what today's going to be all about. Today's going to be how the body gets its energy from its food and understanding a bit more of the, the science, the biology, because if you understand the background, then it makes all the rest of the jigsaw fit together quite nicely. Uh, if it's the first time you watched us, welcome to the show. My name's Steve Bennett. I'm your host today. I'll be joined by one of the country's leading nutritionists, uh, Jenny Phillips. She has worked on so many important cookbooks. She's backed up the Caldeses uh, as the sort of nutri nutritionist behind what was Certainly last month, the number one selling book in the UK. Uh, she's worked with James Gornick, a good friend of ours, one of the country's leading dentists, to come up with the book Kick Sugar. And she's written books herself. Uh, but before we get to Jenny, uh, remember one of the things we're trying to do here is raise money for the food banks across the UK. We're sure, again, this week, well, there's going to be more and more people than ever needing our support and especially families with young children needing our support so if you can do two things if you can drop food off into the the collection boxes in the supermarket that would be fantastic and if you could make a donation either by texting 70450 with the amount you want to donate uh, or uh, just giving up here uh, if you could make a donation that would be fantastic there are families on our own doorstep and we've got to stop this long term, by the way, we have to find a way so we don't even need food banks because it's just so unfair that in our own country there are people going without food. Now, you can go without food. In fact, let me announce, and I'm only announcing it to put pressure on myself so I do it because <laughs> I hate failure. Uh, I'm going on a five day fast. But that is very different to not having food on the table when you need it. You see, you can fast when you know how to access your own body fat. But until you learn how to access your own body fat, fasting is miserable, it's dangerous, you shouldn't do it if you don't know how to get to the energy within your own body. So while you can live without food, it does come with understanding the techniques. If you want to learn a little bit more about that, uh, my podcast that I launched yesterday with the brilliant Dr. Jason Fung uh, is now uh, available, it's on YouTube. Uh, it's under the Fat and Furious podcast. It's the latest one we've done. That'll teach you everything you need to know about fasting. Now, while we're in lockdown, we have got a competition going on where we're asking you to tell us what did you cook? What did you make for the first time yesterday? Send us your photos to Primal Living on uh, Facebook and uh, at the end of lockdown, whenever that may be, uh, we <laughs> We'll uh, pick a winner. We'll look at the best photograph or the best idea or the best recipe and there'll be a prize of either a thousand pounds worth of free jewellery or you may choose the alternative, you may not, uh, which is to come and stay in a boutique hotel in Warwickshire with my family, myself, Nick and Poppy have put the show together and we'll have, uh, we'll put you up overnight and then we'll have a big, big healthy meal together. So keep your inspiration coming in every day. There's been some great suggestions uh, coming through uh, over recent weeks. Also every day we have a food fact and this is for another competition with another prize. In fact exactly the same prize. I have a thousand pounds worth of free jewellery or a weekend stay in the boutique hotel. And with the food fact all we're saying is write down as many as you can remember uh, and if you missed a few days go back and look for that green little box that comes up on the screen find the food facts, just write down the titles. And again, I don't know how we're going to work this one out at the back end, but we'll find somebody that's got the most of them all listed down. And again, we'll be giving you the prize. Today's food fact, um, have we got today's Jack? Yes, Jack's putting his thumb up, is the tomato, which first of all, lots of people think is a vegetable, but it's not a vegetable, it's actually a fruit. And there are certain phytonutrients that we get in a tomato, so powerful, so good for our health, that regularly consuming, especially organic tomatoes, uh, is really, really healthy for us. And what I love about tomatoes is that, you know, not so many people today have greenhouses, but we should get back to having our own greenhouses at home, teaching our kids that 
you know, I'm so worried that there's going to be a whole generation that don't know you can grow things in your own back garden that think fruit and food only comes from supermarket shelves. If you can get your kids back into maybe a little allotment or a little greenhouse, uh, creating food, growing food at home, real food, organic food, then not only is it great for your health, it's great for reminding people to stay in touch with the very essence of how food grows and what it means to our health and also the health of our planet. So today's is tomato. Uh, every day we'll bring you a different food fact and uh, today's was number 24. So by now, hopefully you've got around 24 of them on your list. If not, go back to previous shows, look for the green box and, and away you go. Uh, also, if you can, why not subscribe? Because every week or twice a week, we're putting up new recipe ideas uh, on our channel. And by subscribing, you'll never miss out on the latest primal recipes and the latest primal ideas. And if you could share this site, this channel with your friends, that would also be greatly appreciated. And when you've heard Jenny in a bit, if you give it the thumbs up, that will also be fantastic. Also keep your comments coming in live and also your comments post show. Uh, and that's the way we can interact and answer all of your questions. Now, Let's go uh, straight uh, to Jenny Phillips. How are you, Jenny? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Nice to see you again. How's the last week been in lockdown for yourself? Yeah, it's fantastic, actually, for us. But we're very, um, we've got a lot of people at home. So we've got my children and their other halves and baby. So it's, you know, from that point of view, it's, it's great. I know it's not the same for everybody um but i think we've just all got to make the most of the situations we're in so we're enjoying a bit of uh, quieter time yeah you just said there was a baby on, on, on yeah. in the house quieter time she, she was two last Sunday. Oh, and wow. i tell you what was amazing steve because obviously no party um but everyone came out in the street and they played happy birthday and clapped and she walked down the middle waving like the queen oh how, how lovely yeah. how yeah, lovely right. Well, my mum and dad turn 80 next week. Uh, they're only six days apart. Uh, been together since they were 14. Been married 60 years. And, wow. and, wow. Uh, and we went there the weekend because you're allowed to do that because we dropped off some food and took all the kids. And my, my mum and dad have got these like uh, patio doors out the back. My mum's got Alzheimer's. <laughs> and to remind my mum not to come outside and to stop my kids from going in, he got one of his ladders <laughs> And he hung it up across the patio doors of the barrier, so Mum couldn't get out, and we couldn't get in, and uh, and we had a nice afternoon together, which was was really special. Uh, after dropping off their food, because you have to have an excuse. Uh, anyway, great to have you on the show. So we're going to talk about energy boosting foods, and I'll tell you what I'd like to do today. I'd like to just hand the microphone straight over to you, and I'll keep interjecting with questions, uh, and we'll find some questions uh, from people coming in live. Uh, so talk to us about energy boosting foods and rather than just sort of do our normal of eat this, eat this, eat this, let's try and educate the country about how we get energy from food. Thanks, that, that's a, a great way to head off and, and I think we've focused on metabolic health about being um, managing our blood sugar control and um, not putting on weight and that's one side of it but the other side of the coin, the same coin, is where does that energy usually go in terms of um, making us feel good? Because obviously if we're storing energy as fat, that's not a good thing. Um, but the, the other thing to consider is how do we really optimize producing energy in our own cells? Um, because we don't have like a battery pack in our stomach like a, a, a car has a battery under its bonnet. We Every single little cell makes energy. Mm -hmm. and. I've found in practice, because I work as a nutritionist, every, uh, every time that I can talk in this way to people, people love talking about their bodies and how they work. It can really inspire people uh, to making changes. So I, I agree with what, what you're saying is that rather than just giving a list of, you know, do X, Y and Z, if you can actually get people on board with the science, as you say, um, people get a lot more interested. Uh, it's a lot more fun and it makes a lot more sense. And it translates better as well. So, yeah, just talking more about how we make energy, I think it's a really positive thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, as always, science tries to make it difficult by introducing words like the mitochondria, which is the batteries in many of our cells. And, uh, and as soon as 
you know, for many people, you introduce a big word like that, you know, that the defense goes up, I'm going to go and do something else. So yeah, let's break it down as plain English as we can. Yeah, so uh, mitochondria are clearly very important. And uh, so those are the little battery packs in, in every single cell. And loving our mitochondria is a really good thing to do. So um, I'm, I'm on board with you there. Um, and we need fuel in order to, to make this energy. Um, so whereas a car has petrol or diesel, and if you put the wrong one in the, in the car, that's the problem, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Similarly, if we put the wrong fuel in our bodies, that can, that can be an issue as well. And uh, we, you've talked a lot on your program about carbohydrates and blood sugar. And I, I, I'll declare I'm very much an advocate of, well, real food tops, but within that, um, restricting carbohydrate intake, depending on your metabolic flexibility. So we were just having a quick offline discussion that um, with some people, they have to be really quite controlled in their carbohydrates, whereas other people have got a little bit more latitude. But frankly, I don't think anybody should be eating the sort of 250 to 300 grams of, of carbs that is our current eat well or eat badly plate, whichever whichever way you view it. So I, I certainly view it the latter. Um, I only view it one way. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. that, and that is I want to get rid of it. I want to get rid of it. I want the government to say, no, if you're trying to lose weight, you shouldn't have the potatoes. If you're trying to lose weight, you shouldn't have the bread. If you're trying to lose weight, sorry, the cereals have gone and porridge is out and Weetabix is out and bagels are out and rice is out, spaghetti is out. Uh, and let's focus on, in fact, if you're trying to lose weight, even the banana shouldn't be there and nor should the raisins if you're trying to lose weight. And then let's focus in on the things that are genuinely, genuinely healthy. And that's why I have the Health Daddy campaign going to, in fact, tomorrow's going to be an interesting one because Tom Watson's on. And I'm going to, oh, brilliant. I'm going to quiz Tom tomorrow about, because obviously he spent many years in government yeah, yeah. Or, or certainly the Labour Party as a deputy leader. I'm going to be quizzing him. Why, why, why is nobody listening? You know, why are we still yeah. recommending to my dad yeah. who's diabetic all these things that are caused the problem in the first place? But there you go. Sorry. I went off on a rant. Yeah, no, well, I've got the similar experience. My mum was pre-diabetic and of course that exact picture was mailed through to her and it, it, it creates dissonance, doesn't it? Where mm -hmm. I'm saying, mum, this is what we need to be doing. And then she's saying, but this, and I like you, I literally went through with a pen. But the trouble is there's a lot of faith in that system. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's hard, I think. It would be so much better if we had a consistent message. So I was talking about fuel. Um, and just touching on, well, we've got two fuels actually, mm -hmm. um, carbs and fat. And um, yes, we do need some carbohydrate because I wouldn't ever recommend that anybody cut out all vegetables um, and vegetables contain differing amounts of, of carbohydrate, but some people go a lot lower than others. So in our cookbook that we wrote, the Caldaces and that Dr. Dave Dunwin and Jen Unwin were involved in, we talked about a carb scale. And that reflects the fact that for some people, their carbs are better, very low. And I think you and I perhaps are going towards that end. Then there's kind of a middle group. And then I would say for most people up to about 130 grams, even if you're doing a lot of exercise, is, is absolutely plenty. That allows you to eat plenty of vegetables alongside all your other foods. And then you make good your calories with fat. So the lower you are on that carb scale, then the more you need to access the second fuel which is fat and you've got two sources of fat you can eat it mm -hmm. or you can burn it off your butt which is what you're going to be doing for the next five days yeah absolutely yeah i just hope i flick over the switch because i've been a bit naughty the last week or so i try and do these uh, normally a four day fast at least three or four times a year and normally no problem entering ketosis at all but i have been very naughty in the last couple of weeks in lockdown so it's gonna be really mm -hmm. interesting uh, later on this afternoon when I sort of get you know, three quarters of the way through day one uh, to see if I flick the switch into ketosis. I've got my little uh, keto uh, blood pricky machine to, to find out how I'm getting on, but uh, hopefully all will go well. And I think that she by, you know, you, you laughed when you said at the beginning, you made a declaration because that will help you to keep on track. And it does, because when we do, it's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and when we, when we declare a challenge, then we're much more focused and much more likely to carry it through. So good for you. I confess I have never done a five day fast. Um, I, I, I tend to have a restricted eating window. So typically I'm, I'm probably an eight hour 
window. It's a bit like feeding time at the zoo, isn't it? Talking like that. Um, and I, I have done 24 hour fasts that I've re- I really quite enjoy just out of the habit, really. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, it's, it's horses for courses. But this whole idea of we can actually make energy from our body fat. But as you said in the beginning, you have to train yourself to be a fat burner mm. because most people are fat storers. So they're eating a predominantly carb based diet, often very refined products, all the products that are so heavily promoted at us, not least through our health services. Um, And as we know from Jason Fong's work, that if you're chucking out lots of insulin to manage these refined carbohydrates and sugars, you're not able to access your body fat. It's an either or Um, because insulin stores fat in the body. And so it's not going to let you burn it. So you literally cut that second fat supply off. And then you're just what I call running on the kindling because the refined carbohydrates are quick in, quick out. And therefore, you're just eating constantly, aren't you? And very often we, we're sort of grazing through. Um, whereas when you have a higher fat meal and Jen Unwin's been putting some lovely uh, meals up. I don't know if you've uh, seen in the last yeah. week. He's gone on to an, an OMAD, which is a one meal a day. And I mean, just beautiful, you know, a, a, a fatty pork dish with some double cream and mushrooms and some greens. And that sort of meal, when you are adjusted, when you can burn fat as a fuel, will easily last you the 24 hours. And when, because when, you, when you've burned through that, then you just switch into the body fat, which of course is why most of us do it, is to maintain a good healthy weight whilst enjoying eating really lovely foods. So, it's, so I, I can't bear low calorie foods. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, why? Why would you eat them? <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. I mean, you just mentioned Jason Fung. I actually went back and because we recorded that podcast that was put up yesterday about six months ago uh, or five months ago. And uh, so I went back and listened to the whole thing again yesterday. And there was one bit that stuck out for me. Uh, and what Jason Fung says is that the whole thing with calorie restricted diets First of all, they're miserable. And who wants to you know, do maths their entire life? He says, but the thing is, let's say your average is, let's say you're a man and you burn, let's say you're a lady and you burn two and a half thousand calories a day. Uh, and then you calorie restrict yourself right down to say 1500 a day. He said, well, your body is used to two and a half thousand. So it will downregulate your metabolism. It will downrate your energy to match what's coming in. It's homeostasis. That's what the body has always done. And then if you go really calorie restricted, maybe go down to a thousand. He said, well, life's going to be absolutely miserable because your body wants two and a half thousand. You're giving it a thousand. It will just downregulate, downregulate your energy, your metabolism and everything and try in homeostasis to, to balance it out. He said, however, fasting doesn't work like that. He says, because once your body learns how to burn fat as opposed to sugar, which can take a week or two weeks to retrain your energy source, you're turning your petrol engine to a diesel engine, let's say, or vice versa, or completely electric. Let's say electric, you're going from diesel to electric, uh, and it takes a while for it to understand. But when you do that, now you're not calorie restricting at all. What you're doing is you're going to zero input. And because you've got zero input, but you know how to access your body fat. Well, you know, the average human's probably got about 100,000 calories. Just, you know, one pound is three and a half thousand calories. So if you're 10 pound overweight, you've got 35,000 calories just sitting there waiting to be used. So now you're not in calorie deficit at all. You've got complete access to your own body fat. So for my own five day fast now, as long as I can turn on that switch to that, I won't be hungry at all. I won't downregulate my energy. In fact, I'll have probably more energy because I've got more calories there to access in body fat. And life should be good. I should be able to go to the gym in the morning, as I always do. Everything should stay the same, in theory. But you say in theory, but it, it, it is in practice as well, isn't it? The thing mm. that gets away is the emotional side and that you and I both love food. Um, but yeah, you, you, you mentioned about the, the sources of the calories there. And absolutely. And if we just put it into some sort of context, your body stores in terms of glycogen, which is the, the storage of carbohydrates, you store 2000 calories a day, mostly in the muscle. You've, you've got about 400 calories in your liver, the rest in the muscle. Um, whereas exactly as you say, if you 
look at your calories from from body fat that's huge and i did the same calculation and worked out that one stone which i tend to work in stone still when it comes to weight same um, here. if you want to lose one stone that's forty nine thousand calories around your middle because let's face it that's often where it sits and that's 25 days supply of food it, on a, i was working on a two thousand calorie a day so that's you know we can easily do these fasts provided we can access that. And my point is that because of the use of kindling, i.e. carbohydrates, most people can't because they're not able to access the fat because they eat the kindling, they produce the insulin, the insulin blocks their fat burning capacity. And so it's changing that. And in practice, I, I find that it, it can take people sort of 12 weeks to transition. So starting by increasing the fats and, and reducing down the carbs um, and then moving on to the three meals a day, because let's face it, a lot of people are grazing. Um, and then once you've got that metabolic, metabolic flexibility, then you can start doing exactly what you're saying, which is play around with the frequency. And so if you want to cut calories, give me Jen Unwin's belly of pork any day over a whole vat of rice cakes yeah um so yeah it's just looking at where you get those calories from and um the research in terms of not reducing your um your metabolic rate is absolutely borne out so uh, there was a very good study of um the some of the people in the biggest loser and that showed that actually, yes, the metabolic rate was affected. And then what you get is a rebound because, as you said, you've got you were a two and a half thousand intake, then you drop it down. The trouble is you can't live on a thousand calories long term. And so then when you start to eat normally again, you just pile it back on again. Yeah. The difference with far, restricting calorie intake as opposed to calorie expenditure via fasting is you don't suffer with that problem. Mm. It's just fantastic, isn't it? I like we said there, you know, don't, first of all, stop grazing. I always say, and I got told off of this recently, you know, uh, you know, grazing's for cows. So you want to look like a cow, carry on grazing. And I really got told yeah. off for that one. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 you know, li eating little but often is the number one thing you must not do. I know our grandparents taught us, I think it, it came out after the Second World War when we couldn't get substantial meals, so eat little but often. Then the snack industry went, hey, this is a good marketing slogan, eat little but often. Mm -hmm. uh, but your body never goes into repair mode. And I try and teach people that it's as black and white as you're either metabolizing food or your body's repairing. And especially yeah. this blinking virus around at the moment, if we're just grazing, grazing, grazing all day, if that virus comes knocking on the door, you're not in repair mode at any time. You've got to get into repair mode. That's why you know, you're absolutely right. Cut snacking out, go to three meals a day. Then try yeah. and go two meals a day. And then if you become a fat burner, do your OMAD, your one meal a day type yeah. thing, but high fat. And then when you're in that high fat bit, your body doesn't care then whether it's fat coming in or fat it burns from its own fat stores. Exactly. Whereas, so you're not shutting your body down. Yeah. You're just choosing to use the body fat, which isn't that the essence of weight loss, which is what so many people are striving for. So low calorie foods to achieve weight loss. Yeah, it can work, but it's miserable. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not sustainable. That's the key thing. It's not it? sustainable. Yeah. And then you get in this yo-yo, whereas um, yeah. as so many of us in the kind of the primal arena have shown that it's really sustainable to, to eat like this. Yes. So to kind of recap, we've got our mitochondria in every cell that, that make this energy, but they've got two fuels and uh, carbs and fat. And you can play a game as to where you sit on that. So it depends on your own metabolic flexibility. It depends on your exercise level. So I, I do a lot of long distance cycling. So um, a, a lot of, of the people that I hang out with, they do have a higher carb intake. And I would argue actually sometimes they ought to have a higher fat intake and balance it out a bit the other way. Um, but they, they burn it off by virtue of the activity. Um, so it does depend on, on what you're doing. But even so, you, you need these fatty foods because they're a, a more sustainable form of energy. Whereas I talked about carbs as being the kindling, I think about uh, fat as being the logs because you throw one on the fire and it burns for ages, doesn't it? That's yeah. exactly what fat does. Um, so that's, uh, I think, a really helpful distinction in our two fuels. And the other point we made is that within fat, you've got two sources. You can eat it or you can burn it off your butt. And that then, this whole language about being a fat burner rather than a fat storer really helps people to get on board with this way of eating.
Yeah. So in terms of kind of the fuel, uh, that kind of summarizes, I think. But there's more. There's more that make that, to making energy than than just having the the fuel, because we also need the vitamins and the minerals to be able to drive our metabolism um, uh, and, and release the energy from the food that we eat. So the energy is actually within the molecules of food that we eat. And when we break down that food, adding oxygen into the equation, that's when we release the energy. Um, so certainly the types of vitamins we need are B vitamins, so several different types of B vitamins, and uh, they're widely available, <laughs> meat and fish, liver, particular liver is just such a superfood. Um, mushrooms are a really good source of B vitamins, mm -hmm. and asparagus, which of course is now just coming to season, so treat yourself. Asparagus has got great B vitamins, but it's also um, really good for the gut as well. So make sure that's on your plate in the next few weeks, because this is where it's at, at its peak and, and in season. And also, let me just go back to the, the reason I put my thumbs up for the liver, because one of the concerns a lot of people have when they go primal, they say it's bloody expensive. And I go, well, actually, I can prove to you long term it's not expensive. In fact, long term, it's probably a lot, lot cheaper. Um, and I put my fingers up to liver because... Uh, you go back 50, 60 years ago, we'd have liver with everything from our grandparents. You'd have liver on toast, you'd have liver in a pie, you know, and, and, and people have forgot how to, to cook it. So because people forgot how to cook it, that means there's less demand. Mm. Well, the chickens still have livers. <laughs> so livers are now one of the cheapest meat sources you can get in a supermarket. Yeah. And as long as you can find ways to cook it and use it, it's so cheap and yet it is so nutritionally dense. It's amazing. If you, in fact, if you go uh, to our website, primalliving.com, we put every single recipe out of our book now free of charge on there. And there's a liver pate that my brother taught me that is just gorgeous. It's better than any liver pate you'd ever buy. And yet it's so, so healthy. So healthy and so cheap. And um, I mentioned to you earlier, we've, we've now got a real food dog because he, um, he had a lot of health problems. He, he um, used to bleed from his kidneys. Um, yeah, yeah. And he, he managed for two years and then he got extremely ill and he basically fasted by virtue of the fact he couldn't eat. He ended up in doggy hospital for a whole oh. week. Uh, he's recovered brilliantly, but because he was so ill, they put him on chicken. And do you know what? The whole illness was probably two or three weeks and he stopped bleeding. Wow. So, and he'd bled for you know, two and a half years. Oh. So, um, so I've kept him on a, on a meat diet. And uh, so don't forget the other offals as well. So yeah. um, he, has, he has liver, but also hearts. When I went and asked for hearts in my farm shop, they were like, oh, thank goodness, <laughs> you know, because we've got all these animals and no one's eating this stuff. So we also challenge ourselves on other bits of offal as well, which um, is it, what's quite interesting is if I cook up some hearts, say for the dog, um, then we always give the two-year-old some and she gobbles it up. She wow. absolutely loves it. Myself and my daughter, because we've got more the emotional kind of hang up, that we find it a little more difficult. So we have to train ourselves. But actually, the quality of the meat is beautiful. How, um, how, how do you prepare hearts for a two year old? How, well, how do you prepare hearts anyway? So I, I do it for the dog, mm -hmm. and then we all have a bit off it because mm -hmm. it's, it's proper meat. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the instant pot. Do you know those? So they're yeah, a, yeah. a digital um, pressure cooker. Yeah. So I do them in that. Oh, great. Um, but the meat is very, very tender. And if you didn't know what it was, you would just woof it down. Yeah. So we're training ourselves. The dog loves it. The baby loves it. <laughs> and our farm shop, our farm shop is so happy with us. <laughs> you know, isn't it interesting? Because I mean, the book's called Fat and Furious because I was obese for 20 years, always on a diet. I mean, I was, like yourself, yeah. loved my cycling. I was a proper mammal. And those don't know what a mammal is, today is not the, uh, the time. Middle-aged oh, man in Lycra. Middle-aged man in Lycra. That, I was one of those. And... Uh, and I was obese the whole time, but always on a diet, always exercising. And the reason I'm furious is this, and this is why it's kind of relevant, is that every Easter, every Christmas, yes, thank you, my oh, son. I love to show you looking handsome. My son loves to show me in my big fat days. Um, but here's the thing, while I, was doing, while I was there, we'd have pate for Christmas, pate for Easter that my brother would make. And it was, I was so, I was like, I'm going to gorge on it. And at the time, though, I thought it was really unhealthy because it had lots of butter in. And it's like makes me mad now because I used to have it as a guilty pleasure. And now I know it's actually really healthy. <laughs> so now we, now we eat the pate. I know. I think, I think we eat it like, I don't know, we probably cook it once every two weeks at home. I mean, it's just yeah, gorgeous. Lovely. Cheap, lovely. healthy. And as long as you don't put it on bread, then the whole thing's fantastic. 
on that note, because I know you've got our cookbook there, mm -hmm. um, the Scandi crackers, have you made those? I have. So uh, when we oh, had the Caldices on the other week, uh, they were talking uh, about their crackers and I'd never tried them before. Uh, and I, I, said, I, said, <laughs> I said to Katie, I hope you don't mind. I've done the one minute recipe on our, on our YouTube channel now because it's so easy to make. So and, easy. And, and when I went around to see mom and dad the other day, I bought all the things that are on his wish list including his bottle of whiskey, bless him. Uh, but I also <laughs> bought for him uh, chaya seeds, and I also bought um, uh, poppy seeds and all the seeds you need. And he said, what are those for? Oh, and I also put two pieces of parchment paper in, and through the window for mum and dad, I explained how they make <laughs> their, their, their own biscuits, because uh, you've got to have your pate and something healthy. Yeah, so you can still have everything. And you, you talk about the pate. Being, was a guilty pleasure now it's a core food um but people talk about the french paradox don't they oh they eat all that cheese and all that pate and they're they're not as fat as some of you know not as overweight as a nation as, mm -hmm. as many of the others and of course it's not a paradox is it no, not <laughs> it's just better in the right stuff although i guess there are changes there as well as the, the sad diet takes over the world but the more we can promote really fabulously tasty delicious quite easy to prepare foods actually although you've mm. got to acknowledge that it does take a bit more time in the kitchen and, and i know that's issue an issue for some people if you've got both um both adults working in the household it is more challenging that's where yeah. the stock comes in uh, <laughs> and, 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 and again where we're different to cavemen of course we have fridges so i, I find Ooh. that we do, we, we do a lot of them. It's a bit more difficult for us because we've got five kids to feed at home as well. So, you know, for us, bulk cooking normally gets eaten within an hour. But the rest of the time, <laughs> bulk cooking, often. that's it. Push it in the uh, fridge or the freezer, depending on what it is. And most of this stuff lasts for a long time. Shall we go and ask some, answer some questions? Because so many questions coming in for you. Ooh, fabulous. Let's dive in and say hello to everybody this morning. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, right, here we go. Uh, I make it uh, uh, I make it that your food fat numbering is out by one. Could, could be right, Steve. You could be right. We'll, we'll look into that. Uh, please do get your questions in. Right, here we go. Where are we? I was thinking of tomatoes yesterday, also beetroot. Beetroot a good food? Fantastic. Beetroot, particularly good for the blood, helps to promote nitrous oxide, um, which is good for vasodilation. So a lot of um, performance people are taking beetroot supplements, actually. Um, so it's, it's fabulous for the blood. And of course, I mentioned when you make energy, you need oxygen because yeah. that's the whole chemical reaction to releasing the energy from your food. So yeah, good in, blood supply is important. Yeah, beetroot, <laughs> and nitrous oxide, uh, according to Malcolm Kendrick, who wrote the book, The Great Cholesterol Carno, a real a doctor specialised in the heart. The, anything you can do to get nitric oxide into your endothelium, which is the, the, the lining of the arteries, is good for releasing the tension, isn't it? So uh, beetroot, arteries, yeah. beetroot, good in that sense. Yeah. So definitely. Uh, Sarah says... I like my eggs. Well done. We know that overcooking veg can deteriorate some of the nutrients. Does the same happen with eggs? What a great question. So I wonder what we're talking about. Are we talking about hard boiled eggs or something? I mean, that's OK. Yeah, I, I, she hasn't said there, but it's a, it's a good question, isn't it? We know for a fact that if you overcook veg, this is true, that we lose a lot yeah. of nutrients. Does the same happen with an egg? Well, I would say in a, in a boiled egg, definitely not because it's encapsulated. Oh. So it's all in there. It can't yeah. go anywhere. Um, if you were frying in horrible vegetable oils, that wouldn't be good because you oxidize the cholesterol that are in the eggs. And that's that's not good for the endothelial lining of the of the arteries. Um, but aside from that, I wonder how you overcook an egg. Yeah, we, we, we yeah. think as long as you're cooking it in healthy oils and then eating those oils as opposed to yeah. throwing them away, mm -hmm. Uh, then we, we think you're absolutely fine. Hi, well, both. You and I do the scrambled eggs the same. Cream and butter, yeah? Yeah, although we don't have lots of scrambled eggs because we love putting them in the, in the little muffin tray and make little uh -huh. egg muffins. Ooh, you ever, nice. You, have you ever tried that? No, I've done them in the tomato sauce, which is quite similar. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so we, fr we, we fry up uh, some bacon. Uh, if you haven't got bacon, ham will do. But bacon, spinach mushrooms fry them up first yeah. take your 12 pot baking tray because we don't make uh -huh. cakes anymore but we still got the tray uh, put some butter in so it doesn't stick put them you know what 
you know, put the butter around the side so it doesn't stick. Put your spinach, your bacon, and your mushrooms so all in. Yeah. yeah, your mixture in, and then Make pour. A well. Then pour your eggs in till they're flat. Put them in the oven. Wait till they rise, just like cakes would. And there you've got egg muffins. And if you want to, just to the last minute, put a little bit of cheese on the top. Put it then under again under the grill. You've got the most amazing egg muffins. So oh do... great! So rather than dropping the eggs in and keeping them whole, you're mixing the eggs into yeah. the mixture. Whip, whip, yeah, whip nice. the eggs up, pour them in, and you get this like yeah. looks like a cake, and it's fluffy and it's light yeah. and it's whoa, it's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess the thing there is, it's lots of different ways to eat eggs. That's it. You need you need lots of ways because that <laughs> is probably the best way to start your morning. Uh, hi both. Would it be more beneficial to have your main meal at lunchtime? with regards to giving more end of the day instead of the evening, says Norma. That, I think that's a really interesting question. And I personally think that that is an individual thing. Mm. So um, when I'm doing an OMAD, I am much better off in the evenings. Um, so I, and I think you mentioned you used to do the 24 hour fast in the evening, whereas some yeah. of my friends do do much earlier in the day. Um, from my point of view, I just feel that I sleep better um, if, if I've, I've eaten, it may be psychological, but that's how, how I handle it. The unwinds from the, what they were putting on Twitter yesterday, uh, last week, probably do lunch times because that's what Jen was posting up. So I think it's very individual. I don't think it matters because remember, when you're doing fat burning, you're not suffering from a calorie deficit because yeah. you've got that energy still ticking away. So I'm sure that my my nighttime thing is is just psychological, but that's how I prefer to do it. It's really Doesn't matter. It's really interesting. I, I, I only have mine in the evening. So, uh, yeah, unless I'm on holiday or with the kids, you know, I, I can't remember the last time I had a breakfast. I can't remember the last time I had a lunch. So mine, it just fits my lifestyle to always have my one meal a day in the evening. That just works for yeah. me. But it's I think what, also another point on that, and that's probably why you do it as well, is because it's social to eat in the evening. Yeah. Absolutely. Which people tend to be around, yeah. But so, of course, yeah, whenever, whenever you want to do your OMAD is fine. Yeah, so, so it was a great question there. Because, um, of course, we're always told by so many so-called experts you shouldn't eat in the evening. I mean, but uh, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know. I, I don't think we should eat very close to going to bed because we haven't digested. So you do really want a couple of hours window yeah. before you rest because otherwise you're just not going to digest it as well. And, and the other point on that is if you were a sumo wrestler, you would carb load before bed because you want to put on fat. So, yeah, I, th I think there's a good reason not to eat too close to the bedtime. But six, seven o'clock is perfect for a lot of us. Brilliant advice. Uh, Dev Patel says, uh, a lot of evidence, scientific and real life experience shows low carb is uh, for good health. Yet government eat well is still wrong. Oh. How, how can we trust the government with any advice when basics are wrong? Well, Dev, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, because you could be right <laughs> can we yeah. trust anybody on anything but the point of the matter is mm. this is wrong it is wrong we are campaigning to get it changed and my point is this we either need no government advice at all because prior to 77 1977 we didn't have a guideline and if you yeah. go back and if you go back to when i was born in 1966 the average adult, and you'll like this one, Jenny, because you do stones like I do. The average adult, the year I was born, was two and a half stone lighter than they mm. are today. Uh, and back then there were no guidelines. So we have these guidelines and we're getting fat. We get, we've got these guidelines and we're getting ill. My point is we've got to get rid of them completely. Or we've got to have a different guideline for my son over there who's 18 years old. Who probably wants to put, well, he doesn't want to put weight on weight, but he's, he's happy where he is, to a different guideline to my dad who's got diabetes. We either need probably a dozen different guidelines or none mm. at all. And the crazy. Or just to encourage people to eat real food and, and yeah. accept that some people may choose to eat, um, you know, packaged cereals and things, but don't put them on a healthy eating guide. Yes. Yeah. Let people anyway, choose. You know, Edu educate. We're all on the same. Both there, aren't we? So Dev Patel, we agree with you. The guidelines are wrong. They are crazy. In fact, I think the guidelines are killing people. I will put that on record well, as saying. Well, look, look at uh, diabetes, type yeah. two diabetes, and obesity. Yeah. There is no doubt about it, is there? Not type one diabetes, but there's no doubt about it that the number one cause. Correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm making a bit of a statement. The number one cause for diabetes type two is that segment there. 
Yes, of course, because we know that when we take people off of those foods, that, that they re reduce their dependency on medication or re recover in so much as um, they may be able to just uh, keep on a low carb diet. And the point David Unwin does does talk about a lot, though, is you never re recover, for, you never cure, because if you go back to eating those foods, then um, then the diabetes will come back again. So there is potential yo-yo possibility. Yeah, um, he says yeah. You, you never say you've uh, reversed diabetes. You've put it in to remission. I like that. That's a, the other way around. One. So you, you can reverse it because obviously if you're getting onto more and more medication, you can bring it back, yeah. but you never go into full remission or cure. Sorry, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mixed my words up there. And of course, Tom, <laughs> of course, we've got Tom Watson on tomorrow. Who's... How exciting. Do you know, I often talk about him and his, um, uh, he used to put butter in his coffee, didn't he? Yep. So I often talk about that because then when you've burnt through the butter, then your body says, oh, what next? We'll have a bit of your butt. <laughs> so yeah. you, don't, you don't lose calories. You just burn, burn what you want to remove. Yeah. So I, I used to do that. I used to put butter in or coconut oil into my coffee. And the reason I did it back then and don't today is back then I was trying to teach my body how to become a fat burner because I was exactly. the, the body was still trying to be a sugar burner because that's what it did for like 50 years. Um, so one of my transition things to get it into burning fat every morning was to put the butter in the coffee. Uh, and I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, I occasionally do if I want an energy boost in the morning, but I don't have to do that anymore because the body kind of knows how to do it. Exactly. Uh, it literally is a switch, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, Joan says, good morning from Shropshire. Shropshire. Good morning, Shropshire. Uh, Dev comes back and says, uh, is a continuous glucose monitor useful to track what foods wow. are bag, bad or just cut addictive carbs anyway? Any tips for reducing carbs as vegeta for vegetarians or vegans? Have you worn a, well, Freestyle Libra is the most common one on the market. Have you done that yet, Steve? I, I haven't. And your, your good friend, uh, Dr. David Unwin, says I, I need to give it a go at some stage because apparently you can eat a banana and immediately look on your mobile phone and see what it does to your, your blood glucose level. Yeah. I've done, I've used one several times. I'm not diabetic, but it's fascinating, just fascinating. So, for instance, um, I mean, if I was having a bit of carbonus, I quite like the... Um, the cereal bars that come in a green packet and look very healthy. <laughs> so um, I don't have them very often. So I thought I'd try that. So I'd gone through my normal high fat eating and my, my blood sugar curve was totally flat. One of those up to nine within minutes. Wow. And that's in a metabolically healthy person. Yeah. So they're absolutely fascinating. The other thing I learned that I didn't know, because we've always assumed that your, um, your sugar goes up and then you drop like a stone. Actually, that doesn't happen if you... So I went out for an Indian meal and I did the complete opposite of what I normally did. And I had the poppadoms and I had the rice. And I, so basically, I had like three hours of eating carbohydrates. And it, your, your blood sugar does tend to sort of go up and down, but high. And it stays high till well into the early hours of the morning. Wow. So that tells me that your body's chucking out insulin for an extended period of time. So that was even more frightening than seeing the up and the down, actually. And uh, Dr. Simon Tobin has see, seen the same thing. And he went to McDonald's when he did a challenge with the Freestyle Libra. And he talked about the M because he went up, down, up, down. Yeah. Because, it, you know, it, all that time your body is desperately trying to get that sugar overload out. But yeah, Freestyle Libra... You can get I, you can get them in Superdrug. I do know you can get them online. Yeah. You don't have to have the device now. You can literally download an app onto your phone. So if you've got a sensor and a phone, you're good to go. It's brilliant. It's yeah, a bit obsessive. It, though. Scan, for the, for scan. The, for those that don't know what it is, Freestyle Libra. It's a bit like a, a, a smoking patch. You just put it onto your arm. Uh, it puts a tiny little needle. You can't feel it straight into yeah. the arm. And then it downloads uh, the information to your phone. And basically, you can you can track the glucose level in your bloodstream and track it to what you're eating so literally you can eat that the bar that you were talking about or the rice and see what effect it has on your bloodstream because we're all slightly different so you might react mm. different to a banana to an apple to somebody else so yeah definitely real time and and yeah it's so informative and let's face it if every pre-diabetic was given one of those you wouldn't need to give them any advice at all all you'd need to do was to tell them to track it yeah um, and they would learn immediately what they could and couldn't eat. And, and Dev, part of Dev's that we haven't uh, answered, uh, tips for reducing carbs for vegetarians. So obviously all, okay. the, obviously all the green vegetables, but there's probably a lot more tips. 
Yeah, so if you're a vegetarian, then you have access to dairy, um, which if you tolerate it, and not everybody does, but if you do tolerate it, it's a, a very, very good food, in my opinion. Um, there are some people that don't get on so well, so telltale signs might be skin problems um, or sinusy problems. So, um, so it's not good for everybody, but you do have in the main dairy. Um, and you, if you have fish, that's brilliant. Um, because of course, when you're eating these protein foods, you're eating less carbs and uh, pulses. Now pulses do have carbs in them, but they're reasonably slow release. So you've got those foods plus loads of vegetables and then generous olive oil, eggs, that sort of thing. Um, I have to say it's, it's really hard when you're a vegan because you've, if you've already taken out all of animal pro all animal produce, um, then you're quite limited on, on what's left. And that's why um, very often vegans do better with some supplementation, to be honest. Um, and I just wouldn't, wouldn't mind bringing in The Game Changers here, which is a film that many people have seen, which um, I, I think has got quite a lot of flaws in it, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. um, and at the very beginning of that film, um, the, the, I forget the guy's name, but he says that these people were eating two grams of protein per kilo of body weight, which is high. So the, um, the recommendations are at least 0 0.8 grams per kilo. Um, but that can only be achieved through supplementation. I can't see how it can be achieved through vegetables. And unfortunately, what that film does suggest is that you can just eat loads of broccoli and fulfill all your protein requirements. I don't believe you can. No. I really don't. I'd like, if, if I'm wrong, show me. I'm happy to look at it. But I, I just can't see how you can you can do that without supplementation. Yeah, um, so, 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 so yeah, to, not so, uh, veg, the, old, the odd vegan meal, great. Um, but but personally, I think having a range of proteins is important and will help you to be low carb. Because if you're not having those protein foods, then you are going to be dependent on more carbohydrate intake. Unless yeah. you eat soy, but I wouldn't personally want to live on soy. Nope, it's all GMO. I don't think that's very healthy for the microbiome whatsoever. I mean, there's two, two things there, isn't it, being uh, vegan? First is, where does your nutrition come from? And uh, people think that I'm anti-vegan. I'm not because I also own a supplements company and vegans buy far more supplements off us than, than carnivores because where do you get your iron? I'm not surprised. Where do you get your but iron? Thank goodness that they are. Yeah, so you know, where do you get your iron from? Where do you get your B12 from and, and so on? So uh, you will need to supplement dev uh, if, if, if you're vegan, a good uh, multivitamin. Uh, make sure you've got plenty of B12, lots of iron, um, selenium and so on. Uh, and, and, but then food choices, well, where do you go if you are, let's say you're a vegan and you're overweight and you're trying to cut down on the pasta and the rice and things like that. Uh, make cauliflower your best friend. Uh, because cauliflower you can make into rice, cauliflower you can make into like mashed potato, but it's not potato, it's rice. Uh, make all these new uh, zero carb noodles your best friend. Um, they're kelp. made from, uh, and, and kelp as well, yeah. yeah. Make kelp your best friend. Make uh, um, glucomannan your best friend, which is uh, a root, uh, therefore it's all fiber. So you just have to experiment a little bit. It, it is definitely more challenging for vegans, but I always say to vegans, look, uh, there are three reasons why people become vegan. If you're doing it because of health reasons, you're just wrong. Absolutely. If, if you're doing it because uh, you think that cows put out methane and that's causing a global planet problem, you're kind of wrong because cows mm -hmm. also eat grass and grass sequests carbon dioxide. Exactly. So as long as it's free roaming cattle, they're part of the solution, not the problem. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing it just because you love animals, I'm not going to say you're wrong or say well done to you, but also look at the whole picture. Uh, I, I uh, interviewed uh, Sean Baker the other day who wrote The Carnivore Diet and his view on uh, vegans that, that are doing it because they love animals, uh, he, he, he gives a slightly different opinion on uh, what happens if we're doing too much uh, foresting, if we're doing too much, uh, you know, if we're growing too many crops basically, which is quite an interesting yeah. one. Um, Andrew yeah. says, uh, look up yeah. Dave Feldman's On the Diet Doctor, he's talking about this. Oh, that's good. Uh, does our weight directly correlate to our energy levels? That's a great question from Samuel. Yeah. Well, in my experience, I see a lot of people as a nutritionist inversely. Because if you are gaining weight, you are storing your calories as fat. They isn't, they're not getting into the mitochondria and producing energy. So the typical um, 
uh, presentation of, of an overweight person, especially if someone is also diabetic, is extremely low energy levels. But what we know is that when you then transition into fat burning rather than fat storing foods, that the energy comes back because you're then fueling your body appropriately. So it's inversely um, associated in my experience. And inversely also because most people overweight, like I was for you know, 30 odd years, you're constantly on a diet. <laughs> so because you're constantly on a diet, you're, you're trying to calorie restrict. So therefore you've got less energy because your body's got to have less energy because you've got less coming in. And here's the, the, the thing that few people don't realize. The more overweight we are, people think, well, your metabolic, your, meta, your base uh, metabolic rate must be lower. No, it's higher. If anything, as we put on more weight, we actually got a higher metabolic rate because we've got more cells in the body that need fuel. Uh, and therefore, because it needs fuel and, we, and we're trying to calorie restrict, the energy goes through mm -hmm. the floor. You're just absolutely shattered. You're lethargic. You're tired. Um, so actually, you're right. It's completely inverse isn't it yeah but also you're carrying around you know a sack of potatoes which yeah. would be tiring if you had them in a rucksack wouldn't it yeah absolutely in fact my, my little four-year-old <laughs> we go out for a walk uh, these days uh, near where i live quite a lot and i always invariably end up carrying him and he's four years old and i've never i've never weighed him because i don't think it's appropriate to weigh kids because um, it sends out the wrong signaling but um i've never weighed him but he can't be more than three stone and I put him on my shoulders and I get back and I'm absolutely naked. And yet my wife said to me the other day, but you've lost more than three stone and you never moaned about it when we were going for walks when you were obese. And I went, it's a really good point, you know. It's yeah, so, interesting. It's so tiring. Um, uh, we love our mushrooms and asparagus. That's a great one. Um, Andrew said, I tried uh, the flax biscuits but found that it was too wet in the mix. Is the water level correct? Um, so two things there. Obviously, try a okay. little bit less is water. This the, is this the Scandi crackers? Yes. Yeah. Let me just grab my copy. Uh, so we'll just. Uh, Jen's going to find. Jen is going to find out what the right water level is. Um, the other thing you can do. What I I have is I have a, a pizza tray, uh, which has got all the little holes in it. So there you're getting air from Oh, that's a good idea. So you've got air coming from underneath. Otherwise, you tend to find they're crispy on the top and they stay damp underneath. The other thing, of course, you can take them out, flip them over, uh, or just buy, they're only about three pounds from the supermarket. A pizza tray has holes in and you get air circulating all around yeah. them. Uh, yeah. While you're finding... So I've, I've written here, um, because I, I don't like working in tablespoons, so the, the recipe says five to six tablespoons of water, but I've put down 80 ml, so that's what I put in. Um, it's important to just use the egg white, not the egg yolk as well, because if you use the whole egg, it does make it more soggy. So ideas for the leftover egg yolk is you can stick it in an omelette or I give it to the dog. Um, and just use the white. Yeah. Um, and certainly with, with 80 ml of water, I found mine really quite crispy. I love your idea of using a pizza tray as well, because let's face it, you're not going to be using it for a traditional pizza. So either a low carb pizza or crackers sounds fab. Yeah, um, we, yeah. Lo we love our, we love pizzas in our house. So we've had to uh, do different pizza bases. Uh, the Caldices yeah. do one where uh, they use uh, zucchini. We do one with a little bit of cauliflower yeah. in. There's lots yeah. of alternative yeah. pizza bases. I have to give Katie a big plug here, though. She is so creative when Brilliant. it comes to recipes. So absolutely love this book. And the second one uh, launched <laughs> just as we went into lockdown. So it was featured in the Daily Mail for a whole week. And then we were all locked down. And it, do you know, actually, what day is it? I think it's on Wednesday. We've planned a big dinner, um, which obviously is not going to happen now um, oh, to celebrate yes. the launch of the second book. So when we're out of lockdown, Steve, we'll have to have to get another event we will we'll, we'll do something with the phc i think we'll have a big slap up dinner with the public health collaboration okay. so many questions coming in for oh, you God, so many so them. many uh gemma irvine my question is does coffee slow the absorption of vitamins oh i can't wait to hear the answer mm. to this one uh if we are taking a vitamin supplement when is the best time of day to take it and should coffee alcohol be avoided during that meal Okay, um, well, coffee, as you probably know, has got a mixed um, mixed attitudes on whether it's it's good or bad. It's a good, great source of um, antioxidants, and if you tolerate it well, it's a great food. Does it stop us um, absorbing the nutrients? I'd have to look that one up. 
um, when to take a supplement. It depends what it is, but I, I tend to recommend so certainly a multi first thing in the morning with, brec well, with breakfast. So, uh, supplements are usually, unless they're uh, specified not to, usually better with food. There are some amino acids that you would want on an empty stomach, aloe vera, for instance, on an empty stomach. But generally a multivitamin, if you have it with your meal, um, then it just integrates into the whole food that's going into your stomach. Um, so yeah, I, I, if you're taking um, supplements several times a day, then probably, um, yeah, breakfast and lunch. What do you uh, do, Steve? Uh, do you do uh, the same? Um, no, I'm really naughty and I know I probably don't get the better, best out of it. So uh, I have mine in the morning, just, just for simplicity's sake. Yeah. Uh, apart from a couple that I have in the evening, take my magnesium and zinc at night because I think it helps yeah. promote a good night's sleep. Absolutely. But all the rest I take in the morning. And I even know, for, for example, uh, um, my uh, probiotic I take, I know would be better with food, but I, I, I never eat breakfast. So I take most of them in the morning. I take a couple in the evening to help me get a good night's sleep. I have, uh, on the advice uh, of Patrick Holford, I used to have uh, my two grams of vitamin C, my effervescent, with all my vitamins in the morning. He suggested that I don't do that anymore because uh, you want to space it out throughout the day uh, because vitamin C, obviously, we use it quite quickly. So I spaced that one out. Uh, and, and to your question on alcohol, yeah, uh, here's somebody who likes his wine and his whiskey, but the problem with alcohol, it does stop you absorbing a lot of the vitamin Bs in particular. Um, so alcohol, well, alcohol does several things that, and I'm going to say it right now to stop myself from, because I'm having my five days fast, so, to, so I don't miss my glass of wine and my whiskey. Let me tell myself a little lesson. Two reasons you shouldn't drink too much booze. One, it blocks the absorption of vitamin B. Two, if you are burning your own body fat, it relies on a hormone called glucagon that goes and gets the fat out of your body, stores and turns it back into energy. And according to Zoe Harkham, uh, and I've got personal experience of this, is that when you drink alcohol, it blocks the glucagon, it stops the hormone from being produced, therefore you can't go and release as much body fat as you need for energy. And that's one of the reasons, not just the fact that we weak willed after a couple of wines, it's one of the reasons uh, in my obesity years, I'd always have a kebab when we went to a nightclub, mm -hmm. not just because we were weak-willed, but because glucagon now can't go and get the energy, therefore you need to put more energy in. Mm -hmm. any, any and talking about how we make energy, yeah, alcohol is an energy sapper. Um, and actually, did you know that um, alcohol sales are 31% up in lockdown? So uh, more of us are having a little bit more, and it's easy to do, especially when the weather's nice. So yeah. Yeah, I, I've found I've slipped into having a little bit more than I would normally do. So I've had to pull myself back because I also find it affects my sleep. Yes. Um, yeah. And that's not so good. So, um, yeah, I don't like waking up and feeling jaded because um, I'm well, used to waking up and feeling like a lark. OK, so there's two of us on this call and loads of people watching and we're both the same. I've had way too much. And part of my motivation for my five day fast now is, look, hey, Steve, last week you let it slip a little bit. Um, uh, therefore I'm not absorbing all my vitamins, uh, I put on a bit of weight uh, because I've had to eat more because I'm not using my own body fat so much so uh, hopefully that's answered that one for you Gemma uh, and you got us into confession mode there, it was like, it was like, it was like I was in church then. Um. <laughs> isn't, isn't it important to be authentic as well Steve, you know, yeah. um, I mean I don't eat crap food at all but you know you, we can eat too much of certain things so yeah. um, you know we love food. We so. do. We do, we do. Like uh, we've got fasting up our sleeve, isn't it? Yeah. Otherwise, it's no good. <laughs> Marvellous said, hearts cooking, lots of onions, uh, softened in a pan, not really fried, but just golden in colour. Add the hearts and stir until cooked. Marvellous. I'm going to try that. I've never cooked really hearts, so um, mm. I'm going to have a go at that. Andrew says, I've been in the military for nearly 20 years. Eating as well as I've been told, hard exercise five times a week, was unable to lose the weight around my waist. I mean, that's such a good point from Andrew there, because sadly, and, and somebody said to me the other day, Steve, stop having a go at the Eat Well guidelines, because we all know it's rubbish, therefore um, it doesn't matter that those guidelines are there. Well, it does matter that those guidelines are there, because that's what we feed the military. That's what we feed people in hospital. That's my, my kids at schools, that, you know. Uh, and in fact, the other day, a good friend of mine uh, who runs a, a weight loss 
uh, website does really, really well. Uh, the Advertising Standards Agency absolutely ripped a, what, anyway, tore him apart. They said, because you're going against the guidelines. And he's going, but I'm helping people lose weight. They go, but you're going against the good guidelines. If you carry on this, we're going to shut you down. Um, so those guidelines have to change. And I really, really feel for Andrew Hunt because he was in the army exercising five times a week and yet still has excess weight around the middle. I mean, that says it all. Yeah. Does. You might be interested to know, Steve, I, I went and did um, uh, some talks at the Police Rehabilitation Centre because uh, some of the physios there are really into low carb and, and uh, very much taking it on board to eating slightly differently. <laughs> so that's good, isn't it? But yeah, yeah. I, that's a shame because if you ha are having your food provided for you to those guidelines, that's really tough. I mean, what, you don't really have much choice, do you? Yeah, terrible. Terrified. Dr. Asim Malotra tells a story of, uh, he's a cardiologist and uh, he had fixed this one gentleman, I can't remember if he put a stent in or heart, what, uh, anyway, some serious operation. As he comes round, uh, he, he starts talking to Asim about, you know, how, what should life be like and since where you've got to cut the carbs, you've got to stop eating all those fake oils. And he said, doctor, how am I supposed to do that? Because lunch today and the only thing on offer on the ward was a burger in a bun. <laughs> Yep. It's just terrible. Yep. It's just terrible. So, yep. Andrew, we feel for you. We feel for you. Yeah. Switch to, oh, I know it says switch to low carb, high fat with fasting, and now I'm losing the weight. So, all that time he was in the it army works. for 20 years, exercising yeah. five times a week, he was overweight. He's now gone low carb, high fat, and he's losing the weight. Well, well done indeed. Um, Jackie Glasgow says, well done uh, to Andrew. Yeah, well done indeed. Uh, and, and Andrew comes back and says, thanks, Jackie. Uh, uh, Hannah Anderson has just uh, talked about the right amount of water to put into your uh, biscuits. Uh, is pork red meat? Is pork red meat, please? Would you re recommend pork if somebody has had cancer? So uh, is pork a red meat is the first yeah, question. Yeah, I, I, I'm pro meat, but you've got to buy it from the right places. So... There is some um, quite horrendous pork farming. Um, personally, I go to um, a, a wonderful farm, actually around the corner from Checkers, so maybe Boris shops there as well. Um, and they've got all the animals there, very, very ethically oriented um, and very much into um, supporting the soil. And, and so, yeah, I, I wouldn't have any problems with that. Um, so it does depend on, you, you know, your own... Um, your own attitude, but I, I think that meat is a terrific source of protein, and so generally, I would I would be very supportive of it. I mean, he doesn't um, mention what type of, of cancer. Um, if if one has got some sort of digestive compromise, there might be some differences. So, for instance, if you had anything which would support, um, cause a problem with your bile production, say um, sort of liver cancer or something like that, then you might want some support to be able to digest those fattier foods. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm really pro meat, but alongside huge amounts of vegetables. So I would argue that that is an alkaline diet because you've got all the alkaline minerals such as magnesium in the vegetables. The problem is if you have fast food and you have burger and chips, that's a very acidic diet. So yeah. real foods for me. Yeah. And just so Marvellous knows why we don't talk a bit more about post illness is it's, it, it's illegal for us to really go into any detail about post illness. And post illness diet does take on a slightly different uh, meaning to uh, how you cope with something once you've had it compared to prevention. What you hear Jenny and myself mainly talking about, and much, we're much more freer to talk about, um, is uh, prevention and, and, and diet around prevention. Uh, Vonnie Walton says, help, help, I've lost my low carb bread recipe. Can you pop it on the website? <laughs> We will, we will, we'll, we'll get that done for you. Uh, Hi, Bonnie. <laughs> uh, Daniela says, uh, shifting visceral fat around organs, very difficult, even if I do have a lot of it there. Is fasting the, say again? Even if I do not. Even if I do not have a lot of it there. Uh, is fasting the only solution? Okay, why do you get visceral fat around your organs? It's because you've got high insulin levels and your fat storing. 
so that the insulin takes the extra carbs to the liver and, and stores them around your midriff. Um, so cutting the carbs, cutting the insulin levels um, and fasting then can help uh, with that as well. But it depends on um, what your weight's like to start with. Um, but getting a better quality of diet would be better and maybe some higher fat foods. Yeah. And, and just so uh, I'm very clear to everyone that's listening and watching right now, uh, talk about fasting. Do not try and fast because you will fail until you teach your body how to burn fats. Because yeah. uh, because we don't want you to fail. Because if you fail once, you might never try go back. And it is such a marvelous and wonderful thing to do for your health. Puts you in something called autophagy, which is the body's own repair system. It is so wonderful that I don't want you to fail. So first thing first, follow Jenny's tips, which is cut the snacking out. Just go three meals a day, then two meals a day, then one meal a day. And then you're starting to become a, a fat burner, then give it a go. But yeah. don't give it a go, otherwise you'll just be hangry the whole time. Uh, and it just won't work for you. And it's uh, not safe either if, if, yeah. you know, if, if you're not able to burn fat. So, yeah, you, yes, you'll know you... when you can burn fat because you'll be able to miss a meal and not be hungry. So, yeah. And, and, and don't think fasting is anything about just ignoring hunger. It's not because you, actually when you do it right, you're never hungry. Um, Daniel said, oh, just answer that one. Uh, Jackie Glasgow says, I went low carb and couldn't exercise as I had bad arthritis, uh, diabetes, etc. And within a short while, I'd lost 32 pounds and no longer diabetic. I wonder how our arthritis was as well, whether that was uh, relieved too. So well done. Fantastic. Yeah, well, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. Another person that's, that's sort of got it under control. That's brilliant. I've been doing low carb for seven weeks, but not, but don't measure, says Heather. Absolutely. You don't have to measure. I mean, you know, jumping on the scales works for some people. Jumping on a scale doesn't work for other people. You know, some people get motivated by seeing the weight come off. Great if you're, you know, I'm, in business, I would say you can't manage what you can't measure. So my brain is about measuring. But as I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier on, I don't like my kids going on the scales because it isn't just about body weight. And also the scales can lie a little bit because certainly when you go low carb, the first few days, your weight drops off. But that's mainly because you're not retaining so much water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't worry about not measuring. Don't worry. Not that about important. how you feel. Yeah, absolutely. If you're making energy, you'll feel great. Crikey, we've got so many. Great information about alcohol and hunger, says Andrew. You are welcome. Um, Hema says, hi, Steve. Love the show. I'm pre-diabetic and I've changed my diet after watching your shows. One low GI breakfast. Uh, I've started having a streaming, uh, sorry, steaming plantain and a boiled eggs. What's plantain? Um, it's a root vegetable, I think. Ah, okay. Well, well done. Hema, yeah. well, well done. Eggs, eggs are great for breakfast. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Hema says, I also do intermittent fasting. Well, well done indeed. Uh, thank you. And we'll burn fat as recommended before fasting. That's great. That's Daniela. Uh, and Hema says, um, my blood sugar is back to 5.9 currently. That's good, eh? Yeah. Well, well done. Um, it's so exciting, Steve, hearing stories of people reversing their diabetes because prior to, to this knowledge, um, it, diabetes type 2 was seen as a progressive disease that only led in one direction. And it's so exciting, predominantly through the work of Dr. David Unwin, that this is so now highly regarded as um, a real tool in reversing that diagnosis. Yeah. So well done to those people that have, have succeeded. Sadly you some... must be feeling so much better. Yeah, well done. I mean, sadly, some doctors still don't think it's uh, it's fixable. My dad said, oh, he keeps saying three words. I say, what are they? He said, I can't remember. I say, does he say it's progressive? Yes. <laughs> uh, I say, does he say it's chronic? He went, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I said, was he one degenerative? He went, I think so. Uh, and sadly, my dad's doctor still tells him that. But my dad, bless him, 79, still inject himself every day. He's made that lifestyle choice now. He loves what he eats. He said, I'm too old to change. I know it probably is progressive for me, but I'm making that decision in the knowledge now that, that, that you know, that's what it's done. But for, for most people, uh, I I've been saying for about the last six months, around 70,000 people have been able to come off their medication. But David Unwin was on the other week and he said, now with the help of obviously his schemes and also diabetes.co.uk, over 100,000 people 
have reversed their diabetes and got it under control. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And thank it's, the Lord, because otherwise, yeah. it, you know, because you are, it's not just the blood sugar, it's the lack of energy, it's the putting on the weight, it's being at a higher risk of other complications. It's yeah. not a happy place to be. Absolutely. And we know how, um, yeah, reinvigorated people feel when they reverse that trend. So, yeah, it's great to hear success stories. It really is. Keep, keep I love following Jason Fung's Facebook page because the transformations are miraculous. And what I love is that people look 20 years younger. Yeah. <laughs> how cool is that? Brilliant, isn't it? This is great. Hey, we're all doing the, what's that film? Jen, Jason Button or something? We're all doing a Jason Button or Jensen Button. I oh, know Jensen Button's a racing driver. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Benjamin Button. Benjamin Button. <laughs> Not even Jason yeah. at all. <laughs> Got Jason Fung on the brain. Jenny, thank you for everything today. It's been amazing. Tell your dog well done for not barking. And your little, is it a granddaughter or a grandson you got at home? Granddaughter, yeah, your a little, little one. Granddaughter's yeah. kept quiet and mine have all done the same. So God bless you all. Thanks for your advice. I don't know where the last hour and a quarter went, but it's just gone nice so, so quickly. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on, Jenny. It's a pleasure. Take care. We're just going to do a quick promotion for your website right now. And Yay, then we're going, to, we're going to let everybody get off. Jenny, thank you very much indeed. Wow, wasn't that fascinating? I hope you really enjoyed today's program with Jenny. We're just going to bring up Jack, uh, Jenny's website. Uh, if we can, just coming up right now, you can find out more about Jenny and her uh, her book that she wrote, which is all uh, related um, to cancer uh, and, and nutrition and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, and there you go. Eat to outsmart cancer. Uh, available on, on, uh, for download, available uh, for Kindle, available uh, obviously in the traditional book format. Um, and uh, yeah, what a fascinating show. Thank you everybody for your questions. Uh, if you uh, set, hit subscribe right now, then that will help uh, you not miss out any of those recipes that we put up on a, a sort of a bi-daily basis. Uh, and also, uh, if you've enjoyed the show, uh, if you could go make a little donation to Just Giving, that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. And also, if you could hit the share button. Uh, sorry, I keep asking for all these different things, but we need to let as many people know. Just imagine if you've got a friend or a loved one that maybe is a bit overweight or pre-diabetic, just imagine if you could direct them to this program and get the advice from people like Jenny and celebrate with some of our uh, people that are giving comments so hey uh, celebrate the successes people are having from moving to real food letting people know about this channel hopefully can help the country regain control of our own health till tomorrow god bless and we'll see you again at 10 a.m tomorrow morning